everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Dan, uh, but it's not about me. Uh, first, uh, first talk, uh, first talker, speaker today uh, is Chris Denny. Uh, his title's up there. Your manufacturer is stupid. Please help them. Uh, Chris is the CTO for Worthington Assembly. He's worked in the electronics industry for 18 years and has been a part of all aspects of the design and manufacturing process. He was recently interviewed on the AMP Hour and talked about the future of electronics assembly. Please welcome Chris. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, your manufacturer is stupid. I'm allowed to say that because I'm the manufacturer. Um, so, uh, I feed my family by working for Worthington Assembly, CTO for Worthington Assembly, but a lot of people here uh, might know me a little bit better with uh, uh, the partnership we have with a company called Circuit Hub, uh, where my official title there is the uh, jerk who tells you there's a problem. Because I do a lot of customer support and I, and, and, uh, uh, I run into a lot of design issues, and uh, that's really where the genesis of all this came from. And the idea of your manufacturer is stupid is, is not necessarily that they actually are, but uh, that they actually have to, they actually have to act stupid. You know, they have to play dumb because uh, making assumptions about your designs and the issues that come up uh, are always dangerous and very expensive. So we can't make assumptions. Uh, and so why do we have problems uh, with things? Well, just a lot of times information is unclear, uh, right? And uh, phone calls need to be made. And I hate people calling me. And uh, I hate calling people. <laughs> it's always frustrating. It slows everything down. And especially when you have a million dollars worth of equipment tied up and then all of a sudden a problem comes up, uh, it becomes a real headache. And a lot of times when I suggest this sort of a thing, a lot of people will say, yeah, but uh, machines, right? Machines build things. And uh, yeah, it's true. Machines do build things. Um, this is our machine. And no, it, it never gets boring. Um, even after nearly two decades, it is still so fun to watch these things do their work. Um, but no, really, the truth is that humans are building things. Humans are involved in everything. And they're verifying the machines, right? So this is a capture of our programming software for our pick and place machines. Somebody is taking the time to draw all these parts and make sure they line up and they, they have the correct polarity. And when it comes to through hole parts, right, these things are populated by hand. Uh, so it's not, it's not machines doing these things for the most part, um, depending on the volumes. Uh, it's really people verifying that the machines did everything properly. Uh, there are machines that verify the machines. Yes, they exist. AOI is, is where I kind of got my start in this industry. Uh, but uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll have a human verify the AOI. Right? There's always going to be a human involved. And uh, you don't want them making assumptions about uh, your design. You, you want to make sure that they're getting things right. Uh, and so this talk is really about the first time you're getting something made. Because once, once you've built it once and it's a second order or third order, chances are it's going to go pretty smooth. They've solved all the problems already. They're not going to run into a lot of issues, maybe some end of life stuff. But for the most part, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go smoothly. But there are these tent pole problems that we tend to run into, that we tend to see quite regularly. And I, there's so many more I wanted to talk about. But I, <laughs> I had to limit this talk to at least, at least something. So the first thing I want to talk about is the importance of being able to identify the polarity of your components when you're designing things, making sure that is abundantly clear, just ridiculously clear. Pretend your manufacturer is stupid and that they, they can't figure this out without a ton of information from you. This is the number one problem we run into. It is the number one problem we have to deal with, is identifying the polarity of components. Uh, things like ICs, identifying what reference designator it is, what location it is. Uh, what's the pin one? Diodes, LEDs. LEDs are the bane of every assembler's existence. <laughs> they are so frustrating, so frustrating. There's very little standardization. Okay. So this is a capture from uh, the Circuit Hub software, uh, just the rendering engine. And you can see on this inductor, you have this L8, and you have this little, he's obviously trying to show us where the pin one is, but he's got it kind of drawn over his pad, and the fab house is just going to, they're going to take, that's going to be gone, right? That, that we're not going to be able to see that on the silk screen. And then even when you get that inductor mounted on there, you can't see it anyway, right? It's gone. 
Same thing with QFPs, right? QFP, he's got a nice little circle there identifying our pin one, identifying our quarter, but then you put the part on, you can't see it anymore. And that's okay, like we will figure this out, but it's just a little bit of friction in the process. It's always just kind of dragging along. So we see these kinds of things a lot. So I, I pulled up KiCad and I'm, I'm a super novice on KiCad to be clear. I, my, I do most of my EDA work in uh, Eagle, I'm afraid to say, but, um, <laughs> But I, <laughs> for this talk, I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to learn it. And, and I actually, I learned to really, really enjoy it. I really like the software. But we see this kind of thing a lot. Uh, if you have limited space, you're going to do this kind of a marking if you have a really tight design. Uh, it's a little bit better if you can put your pin one marker outside of the part. So then after that part gets populated, you can still see where the pin one is supposed to be. Uh, the built-in libraries are actually excellent. They do these long lines. That's not something I'm used to seeing. I don't know if it's a standard in Europe to do this long line, uh, but uh, mostly, most of the time in the United States, we get those little, we get those little dots, right? Uh, and that does tend to work quite well. Here's like what a QFP will look like where you have that long line, or sometimes you get this little uh, angled line showing you the pin one. But by far, my favorite thing that designers do is they make their pin one a rectangle, and they make everything else some kind of rounded rectangle or an oval shape. This is by far my favorite thing. And the reason is because you can't screw it up. Uh, you can't, the silk screen might go away. Something might cover the silk screen, but the copper is always going to be there. And your fab houses aren't going to change this. At least, hopefully they won't. I haven't seen any that change it. Um, so, but do a combination of both, right? Get your silk screen in there. Get your square, your squared off, your rectangular pin one. And it's going to be abundantly clear how this is done. Now, I wanted to make this a little bit of a tutorial for people who are new to this. So I have some screenshots of exactly where it comes from. So you go into the pad property. You literally click this drop down. You choose rectangle on your pin one. Right? It's as simple as that. All your other pins you're going to choose as ovals. And then you're going to end up with a nice squared off pin one. Your manufacturer is going to know that's pin one every single time. Trust me, it's wonderful. I love it when, or when designers do that. LED orientations. All right, we got to talk about this. <laughs> There's nobody standardized on what pin one is on an LED. Is it anode? Is it cathode? Yes. It's nobody's decided. So uh, this is what you'll typically see in your libraries. I far prefer A and C. It's so much better. It's so much better. Don't just name them, number them. It's okay, KiCad accepts this. I'm so glad they don't accept only integers for your pin numbers, but they will accept characters for your pin numbers. So you put a C in there for your cathode. So then when we get these, these files, we see a big A, big C. We know, yep, I know exactly how that thing's supposed to go in. We're gonna look at the data sheet. We're gonna see how, where the cathode is. We're gonna populate that thing correctly every single time. Notice the square, notice the circle again, right? You can do those sorts of things. Uh, positive and negative on the silk screen is great. This is for through hole. Obviously for SMT, so this is the default library, one and two. I hate one and two, but we'll figure it out. At least you have a nice silk screen there. The default library has a nice silk screen. It's gonna show us where the cathode is. Uh, but I'm saying put the C on there. Put that C on there. It's gonna be so much more helpful. We see this a lot. This is great too, especially if you have limited space and you, gotta, you don't wanna put silk screen on the outside of it for some reason. Put a little... Uh, Diode marker on your silk screen underneath it is good. If you have a little tiny part, you can just put a little arrow pointing at your cathode. Those work good too. Uh, but yeah, uh, identifying polarity is the thing we spend a lot of time on the first time we build something, making sure that everything is mounted correctly. And do we ever get it wrong? Can anybody say their manufacturer's gotten it wrong before? They themselves have gotten it wrong before? Yeah, so the more time you spend on doing this and following these sorts of best practices, the better. Um, and if anybody wants these slides later, I'll, we'll publish this on our website so you can look back at all this kind of stuff. All right, so identifying polarity. Next thing is silkscreen legibility. Are we actually gonna be able to read this stuff? Uh, because believe it or not, we, it's super helpful to look at your silk screen. We can, figure, we can go back to the files, we can look up in our computers, we've got computers at our desk, that's great, but if you're just holding it in front of you and you see it, done, you're moving on. Uh, so we really like legibility. Nice, clean, easy to read, legible, uh, that's what we wanna see. So when we talk about the character size of silk screen, we're not talking about minimums. Minimums are there if you need to be there, okay? <laughs> don't, don't just set your, your EDA tool to draw all your characters at minimums. Uh, you're, it's, 
your fab house is going to struggle with those. Uh, you don't need to make them enormous, okay? So you don't need to make these big giant things, and then you have no room for the rest of your layout. You want something in between. You want a nice, cozy character size. Nice and simple. Everybody's happy with it. Your fab house is happy with it. Your assembly house is happy with it because we can read it. It's very simple. One millimeter height, one millimeter width, and a 0.18 millimeter line width. I'm sorry, I live in a metric world at work. <laughs> you can do the conversions to uh, imperial. Uh, but those are the, those are the sizes. Uh, one millimeter by one millimeter and 0.18 millimeter width. Any fab house will be able to do that. They'll be able to draw that. It'll be very easy to read. It'll be relatively small, so you can still fit the rest of your layout in there, but at least we can read your reference designators. Uh, simple as going into file board setup, and then you'll find uh, this window, and this is the line we're interested in right here. Uh, so for your silk layers, that's the line we want you to edit. And if you do that, and then you do your layout, uh, or, or you do your footprints, everything, all your silk screen is going to come out nice and legible and clear. So uh, this is very easy, neat to read, uh, and it's also important to recognize that all those reference designators are near their component. They're not on the component, they're near the component. All right? And so just looking straight down, you can see all those things. Don't do this. This, this is tough. <laughs> this is an actual thing that we actually built. And uh, it, it's, it's busy, right? It's hard to see everything. Uh, and uh, again, everybody says machines build things, but humans have to take the time to verify the machines. Uh, and so you, you end up with this kind of thing where you've got reference designators, but w <laughs> you get the idea. It's, it's, uh, it's a struggle to try to read these things. So for example, look at this. You see, the, uh, you see R11 right in the center there. To the right of that, you see C30 and R29. You know how I know there's a C30 and R29? It's because I had to pull up the Gerber data, but you'd never see it. You got the vias right on top of it, right? Uh, so uh, one nice thing, though, you'll, you'll, you'll see, uh, excuse me, this will be a, you see the R5 is a little bit covered too, right? Uh, the fab house will sometimes move these things a little bit, right? So sometimes the fab house will try to correct it, but they don't want to spend all day correcting these things. Uh, you're far better off uh, uh, trying to get these things to line up. So notice uh, the C20, they pulled that down so you can actually see it, but the, the uh, I was wrong, it was actually R32 and C20, but anyway, see? That's why, that's why you need to make it clear. Uh, but this, the R on uh, the 30 is missing, because there's a via there. Well, you can actually print silkscreen on top of vias, or solder mask on top of vias, and then you can pr print silkscreen on top of solder mask. So uh, this is so easy in KiCad. It is so easy. Make sure that box isn't checked, all right? Uh, there are absolutely times where you need your vias exposed. This is not an absolute rule, but if you don't need your vias exposed and it's okay to cover them with solder mask, make sure this box isn't checked when you're exporting your Gerber plots. Uh, and then it'll come out nice and clean like this. See, all the vias are still there, but they're all covered. And see how much more legible everything is and how much easier it is for, to read everything? Uh, really helps a lot. And then you can see in this picture, the fab house did print right over those vias. Here's a zoomed in view. See the 50, right? The, uh, the R5 and uh, C, you can see how they printed right over the vias. Uh, so okay to do that. So for silk screen legibility, a summary real quick. The one by one millimeter uh, characters, 0.18 millimeter line width, uh, moving the silk screen away from holes and pads and vias and trying to just make it so it's nice and legible and uh, tent vias uh, if you can and then, and then you can put your silk screen on top of those if you must but you don't absolutely have to. I'm running through this quick because there's a lot of information here but panelization. We have to panelize your boards to do the assembly. Uh, so a lot of times designs will come into us like this and we say, great, we're going to just smash all those things together and then we find out later it's got these big giant overhanging uh, uh, potentiometers. But we've panelized them all like this. So, <laughs> so now we've got to break all of those out. And uh, so a good thing to do is, okay, so here's the original design. The footprint was totally fine. Everything fit, right, which is, that's the most important thing. Make sure everything fits. Uh, it matched the layout perfectly. But if you look at the rest of the drawing, you see this big mechanical overhang. Don't try to draw all these crazy little features in order to inform us that there is this overhanging area of the potentiometer. Just put a very simple little outline. 
Now that's going to hang off the edge of your PCB, and that's fine. They're just going to trim that off. Fab House is just going to trim off that silk screen, but at least they're aware of it, right? At least they're aware of it. So when they go to do the panelization, they're not going to jam these things up next to each other. Uh, even better, if you want to take the time, we love it when you guys do 3D models. 3D models are awesome. And uh, they're really, really helpful. And then if you do the silk screen with the 3D model, it's just like totally clear how this thing gets put together. And so we can really understand how we're going to panelize these things. So uh, any kind of information like that that you can give us for panelization, helping us to understand where things hang over, all that kind of stuff, we can panelize so much better, so much more efficiently. And uh, it'll ultimately drive costs lower because we don't have to break them all out to do the assembly one at a time. We can do them in those nice big panels. So quick summary, uh, silk screen representing the body. It doesn't have to be real elaborate, just has to be accurate, representing something that's hanging over, and add a 3D model if you can. Those, those really are helpful. Um, PCB properties. Here's one that is uh, uh, useful even for the assembly house. Because a lot of times, with us, we, we don't insist on making sure we get to buy the PCBs, but we kind of insist on making sure we get to buy the PCBs. So we need to know specific details about your design. Uh, here's an, 10 things we see pretty regularly. The number of layers. Now you say, well, I gave you the Gerber data. You know the number of layers. Tell us the number of layers anyway. It's like a good checksum. You know, it's like a good, well, you said there's six layers, but we only see four. Oh, I sent you the wrong files. You know, it's a great way of, of making sure things are done properly. Overall PCB thickness, your TG rating, your inner and outer copper weights. If you don't know these things, talk to your manufacturer. They'll help explain these things to you. Silk screen color, solder mask color. Uh, do you uh, have V and pad? So you have micro BGAs and things like that that you need filled and plated. We need to know about that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, if you have impedance control requirements, don't just assume everything is going to come out right if you have some impedan uh, impedance requirements. And generally, there's a conversation to make sure we nail that. And then e-test should always be required, 100% of the time. PCB should be e-tested. E I don't care if you're making badges for a conference. If any of you got a badge that didn't work, you're pissed, right? So <laughs> just make sure you get e everything e-tested. I think the drawings layer is a great layer to do these kinds of notes. Uh, you know, there's other, others that you can use. Don't use a copper layer. That's going to cause problems. Uh, use the drawing layer. It'll be fine. Uh, add this to the text properties uh, of that, uh, or create a, create a, uh, a text uh, field and, and add all this to the text properties, and uh, we'll see all that information. Um, you can also fill out the page settings if you want to put your contact information in there just in case this goes through a purchasing agent, but you're the engineer and you want to be contacted. Uh, that's helpful to put all this kind of stuff in there. So then when you export your plot, you just export this particular drawing as a PDF. It doesn't have to be Gerber. PDF is easier because the guys in the office, may, they may not know how to use a Gerber viewer really well. The engineering team knows how to use a Gerber viewer really well. Um, but maybe not the guys in the office who are actually, you know, communicating with vendors and these sorts of things. So export that as a PDF. You get this nice frame drawing, and you see all your notes on there, and uh, it's very clear, easy to read, exactly everything we need to know. Uh, and then over in the corner, you have all your your contact details. A lot of the examples I have in this uh, presentation are from my friend Sam, uh, who generously donated this. It was an open source project using KiCad. It was, it was very cool. Uh, so that's why I used all his contact information on there. Uh, but yeah, again, that's, that's the information a lot of us want to know. Uh, if you include those things in there, if you don't know what those things are, that's totally fine. Just ask us. We can, we can a lot of times help you uh, walk through it. Okay. Specific manufacturer's part numbers. I'm excited to talk about this because yesterday somebody said something that I'm going to completely disagree with, and I think that's always fun when you have a nice debate about these things. Uh, but we love to have specific manufacturers' part numbers. Uh, yes, even on caps and resistors. It's totally fine if, if it's not that cap or resistor is not available and we have to cross it. But you know what we're going to get from the manufacturer's part number? Every spec we need. So if we want to recommend a cross that we have in stock, we can just look up all the specs and we can say, hey, can we use this one? It's sitting on a shelf and we're off and running. So even including manufacturer's part numbers for every single part number is great. We're going to see all the values that are really important to us. Uh, you can put multiples in there. It's totally fine to put multiple part numbers, say Alt-1, Alt-2, Alt-3, something like that, uh, in case one of them is not available. 
So this will be what it ends up looking like. Uh, you can go to Tools, Edit Symbol Fields, and you'll see this is your whole uh, list of manufacturer's part numbers, and the manufacturer is helpful too. Uh, then once you generate your BOM, all that stuff's going to be in there. Uh, it's going to be really helpful for us to see all that information. So specific manufacturers' part numbers, purchasable part numbers are really helpful. If it's like a proprietary thing or some kind of sample, that's fine. You know, you can call that out and you can explain that you have samples. You're going to consign that part. We can deal with it. The other thing I like this, and this is a bit of a plug, but I, I'm really pr proud of it, is because Circuit Hub, if you were to upload these files to Circuit Hub, you will have a quote literally in seconds because you'll have all your manufacturer's part numbers in there and it'll go out, uh, call all those APIs, pull everything back in that we need and uh, you'll have a quote in seconds. Now Worthington Assembly is a traditional manufacturer. If you come to us and ask us for a quote, as long as our quoting staff is slow, you might get one in a few hours. But if they're busy, it might be a week. Uh, so having a quote in seconds cuts your lead time down immediately. You don't even think about the fact that you're saving time because you're getting the quote faster. You're asking for a five-day turn on most boards. Well, you've already cut out potentially a week uh, by using a service like this and getting a quote. Uh, so specific manufacturers' part numbers are really nice in, in being able to do these sorts of things. And now this is like a legit price. Like this isn't like a back and forth. This is like you'll pay this and, and you'll get your boards. There's not like an estimate here. This is an actual price you'll get. And you have these two little sliders. You can choose how many boards you want, how quickly you want them. Uh, it's really pretty neat. There's a nice uh, board rendering uh, view. You can zoom in and out and you can see all the different layers and that sort of thing. You can specify, like I talked about earlier, we specified all these details in text. Well, you can specify them all in these, uh, this specific form, which is also quite nice for being able to do this sorts of things. So include those uh, part numbers, the manufacturer, um, and if you do that when you assign the footprint, uh, if you make that a habit, that'll, that'll uh, make sure it always gets done. And then you'll have real legitimate quotes in seconds and not just days. So those are the tent pole problems. This is the, this is the slide. If you want to take a picture of anything, this is, <laughs> this is the one to take a picture of. Um, and, uh, but like I said, we'll be publishing this later so everybody will have access to it and uh, you can see it and you can reference it later. I apologize, it's 108 slides, but hopefully you'll be able to find this one. Quick bonus tip. Many of the libraries in KiCad do not have solder paste on the center pads of QFNs. I don't know why. I don't know why. We need that information. That'll help prevent problems. So make sure to go into your libraries, make sure that the uh, solder paste is specified there. There are so many other things I wanted to talk about. I'm already out of time, so I could not get to all these. And this list goes on. I couldn't think of everything. Uh, but if you want more information, you can go to our website, wordintonassembly.com slash best practices. I write most of those articles there. Um, and, uh, and my personal website, I'm starting to publish some of these on my personal website as well. Should anything happen at Worthington Assembly, <laughs> they're backed up, right? As we heard in the talk this morning, make sure this information spreads and gets shared. Um, and then Here's my contact information if anybody wants it. I'm happy to chat anytime. You have any questions about your design or have any improvements, would love to talk about it. And thanks to Sam for letting me use his, uh, his, his design in this, this presentation. Thanks, guys.